Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Gentleman's Psychic. Welcome back to Storytime. I am your host, your MC, your Master of Ceremonies, Richard Lale. Richard Lale is one name, not two. If I were just Richard, I'd be a dick. Anyway, welcome to Storytime, where I read classic stories. We've got a couple of minutes, so while we are waiting, let me see, I, can I share? I wonder if I could share this while I'm here. Maybe I should. Well, share me now. Post to Facebook. And then we'll come right back over here. Good evening, John Maxwell, Matthew. Hello, my friend. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I have been going to the gym. Uh, so I have, you know, witchcraft is great, but one must also exercise the body. We'll wait until the clock strikes before we start reading. Oh, and we're going to announce tonight what book we're reading next. There was one book that received more votes than all of the others, so we will read that book. I'll tell you. Hello, Mary Jane. Welcome. So to, I was just saying, I've gotten back to Zen of the last week, and sit, sitting has been huge workout. Nice. Hello, Mike Pope. Uh, nice. Yes, it's really good to be back in the gym. I was, I had a couple of years, several years of of what I can only describe as hell. And so I, I fell off of my training wagon, but I am back and I'm feeling better than ever. Oh, here comes the clock. All right. Oh, yes, Mike Pope, you can see my nails. They are this beautiful burgundy metallic color. Hello, Melissa. Welcome, my dear. So would you like would you like to hear the book that we'll go, we're going to read next week? Or would you like to wait until the end? You can go ahead and type it right there. And uh, this is another sort of democratic thing to do. You could vote right now what you would like. Thank you very much, Mike Pope. Um, so we can reveal it now or we can reveal at the end. What would you like, my darlings? What would you like? Well, if there's no answer, my lovelies, if there's no answer, if you'd rather it now or at the end, then we shall wait until the end. Why not? That way then there's a little surprise, something to look forward to, because I have a sneaking suspicion we may finish this book tonight. Hello, Laura. Lovely to see you. Yes, surprises at the end. Um, we may finish tonight because I think we're very near, but who knows? Maybe one more night, but I think we're pretty close. Chapter 26. My petulant little Mary. Stupid old world, you say? Ha! Ah, let me tell you something of this world, my child. It is a fine old world, and if you were a real genius, you would perceive it. Its adjustments are perfect. There is the springtime when the nature unfolds her verdure at, at, her, at the kiss of the warm south wind when the robins nest and the dove coos lovingly to its mate, when the crystal mountain streams burst forth from their prison of snow and the voices of nature unite in proclaiming the glad seed time. The crimson-throated scorpion plays again along the ground and fences. The inconsistent chameleon glides in opalescent beauty from rock to tree, while the model serpent the impersonation of myself, creeps from its winter home. Later is the harvest time when the great reaper of nature garners in the winter's store. Nothing is overlooked. The hand that fashioned the things of earth was mindful of even the atoms. 
In the marvelous plan of nature, there are no dolts and sluggards, no blots to mar the beauty of a perfect whole. All is harmony, and only man is vile. Yes, proud, vain, foolish creature that man is, he has made this realm once a stranger to the presence of evil, the devil's playground. Bright, glorious, wonderful world, yours contentedly, the devil. 27. My own unfathomable Mary, let me confide in you a little secret, little girl. Your devil must surely be a hero. Today, I entered that Sanctum Sanctorum, the women's club. I had been told that it, in all probability, Mary McLean, would be discussed, so I went. It proved to be a particularly fortunate appointment of, of fate that took me there, for much, aside from what was said about your wonderful self, transpired in which I am interested. How did I enter? I donned a shirt, waist and short skirt, assumed an intellectual air, and affected an attitude of supreme importance. I drew down the corners of my mouth, adjusted my eyeglasses, and scanned the whole gathering of the scrutiny of one looking for a wolf in sheep's clothing. I displayed a work on parliamentary ruling, also a suspicious-looking little wallet, which I contrived to make appear as it contained papers of importance. I was thin-checked and wore a cadaverous look that suggested patient, faithful work along the lines of essayed by women, and confirmed the suspicion that I had mothered many clubs. I sat down on the lower side of my thin hips, adjusted my shoulder blades to the back of my chair and my sharp knees to accommodate the suspicious-looking wallet, and surrounded myself with the halo of patriarch. Good devil that I am, I was, I was practically unobserved. Presently, the meeting was called to order by a symphony in black and green, whose head rose from her shoulders at a forward angle of 50 degrees or less, and whose belt line was elevated in front, the pity of it, to afford room for the disproportionate paunch that years of ignorant, slothful attitudes had created. The texture and style of her gown were sadly incompatible with the figure which it clothed. The stamp of commonality will show through the most gorgeous apparel. While the untaught, uncultured mind can never be masked by the accessories to the modern toilet table, the devil chuckled to himself as he surveyed the crowd. How was it, the chairman, held in the estimation of those who faced it, with a capital I? This, the devil, sought to discover the faces of some lighted up with enthusiasm, probably because it evinced a preference in presenting the left profile, which bore the unmistakable stamp of the female Judas and displayed to full advantage the real ostrich feather which her milner had arranged quite fetchingly on the side of her headgear. Others seemed to wear the look of admiration, but whether it was inspired by the scintillation of the diamond sunburst that glittered upon her, the breast of it, or whether it arose from re remembrance of the kindness of fate, a fate that had lifted it, from obscurity in the little Oklahoma town to the presidency of the Woman's Club, the devil could not decide. Others wore the same stereotyped smile and pose of affection which had been studiously cultivated in the school of society. 
and which is always assumed in public, whether the occasion be an afternoon tea or a memorial service. Still, others were wrapped in an expression at once tense and hard that betrayed the effort being put forth to sustain the role of intellectuality and strong-mindedness. They scorned to observe the length of the train that spread out the rear of it. it. There was a whole phal phalanx of those who, doubtless, according to the law of philosophy governing uh, that the attraction of likes, were as stolid and as expressionless as a piece of masonry. They just, just why they were there, the devil not, never quite understood, but they were there in goodly numbers. Then there was a distractingly large number the devil was surprised, who were there slowly because the rumor had gained circulation that refreshments were to be served. They dutifully sat through the performance, heaven help them, sustained by the hope that the hour for the exercise of their particular talent would come after a while. There was a final sprinkling of open, honest faces which clearly told that they were there for mutual help and benefit. The devil trembled at the thought of Mary McLean might receive the, at the hands of this assemblage. Presently, with an imperious rap of the gavel, order was called out of chaos, and the various countenances assumed intensi intensified expressions. With something after the order of tra travesty on the goddess of liberty, enlightening the world, our female personification of it, arose to deliver a salutation to her flock, and with the ego, which was plainly uppermost in her mind, as well as cunningly woven into her remarks, the devil first thought, the first thought was that she had been reading Mary McLean. There was a crafty little smile and a pensive droop to her of the eyelids that were quite fetching, and which I noted with a view of reproducing on similar occasions. With another imperious gesture that was more indicative of the mistress of Kansas Farm than of the presiding officer of any organization of women, the wonderful machinery of the woman's club was in motion. The devil sat there, unmolested, but interested and wearing a look of unconcern. This was a new department for him, who always fancied that any organization, exclusively female, afforded little opportunity for him to accomplish much along his particular lines. True, he did not find the material there that he delights to handle, but there was much that he could use to advantage. Women, among women, are about as loyal to the devil as they are when there is a man in the case, but their maneuvers are of such a nature that the devil finds little interest in perusing them. After a after a labored discussion, both pro and con, it was decided to have the program of the afternoon before the business session. There were many whispered protests from those who had sat mute as an oyster during the discussion, but the program progressed as voted. There was a paper on the moral influence of soci sociology on the next generation, but as the devil is interested in this generation more than in the next, he did not follow the intricacies of the logic by which certain deductions were reached. He prefers to prove his own theories according to his own syllogisms. This was followed by a volumin voluminous paper on the character of the Byzantine art as compared with other pre-Raphaelite painters. With this, I was actually bored. However, with the courtesy that the devil knows so well how to assume, I sat through it and concealed as best I could my in 
immoderate enjoyment of the incongruity of women delivering a discussion on this subject when she did not know a picture of the Byzantine school from an Egyptian mosaic. Of this, the devil was thoroughly convinced. When she had finished, there was a storm of applause that came simultaneously from the intellectual element and from those whose paramount interest was in the movements of the committee holding forth in the kitchen. The devil drew forth his little notebook and tried to calculate the advantage such a paper would have been to those in attendance, provided they could have comprehended the gist of it. But it was a problem in which the only given quantity was an audience that did not know Raphael Madonna from Burne Jones' Vampire, and he found that he could could deduce no results. So he readjusted his shoulder blades to his chair and his spirit of endurance to the occasion and listened to the old college-worn, unspeakably useless, hopelessly uns unsettable discussion as to whether Bacon or Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. When the subject was announced from the chair in a manner which plainly said, this question which has occupied the attention of critics so long is now about to be settled, and the mistress of research stepped forward to deliver her wise composition, a look of anticipation was transmitted from the listener to another, while the devil only laughed. The vanity of mortals is about the most amusing feature of the devil's work. However, he listened with all difference to some stolen pages from Ignatius Don Donnelly, read with gusto of her own language, and heard the fallacious arguments with which she attempted to prove her position that Bacon was the real author, arguments about as conclusive as the syllogisms with which all early students of logic prove that a feather is heavier than lead, or that a, a biscuit is better than heaven. After all, the evidence had been presented, and in the discussion that followed, the arguments both pro and con had been heard. The only tangible point of conclusion was who wrote Shakespeare. The devil could have settled the question for once and for all, and had he felt so inclined, for who knows better than he, the author of that grand work? To say that he was amused does not express the half. There was a certain futility, an impotent aimless in their efforts to establish the identity of the author, while the real author, the immortal Shakespeare, was permitted to remain a sealed book. They could grasp the distinction between the two names, but the majority of them had no comprehension of the legacy left to literature and to them by the divinely inspired Bard of Avon. There was a sense of relief when the subject was dropped without decisive verdict. And the more commonplace, common sense one of raising children introduced for discussion. It was a subject that had a practical side, at least, which they could grasp and understand. But even here I was impressed with the same incongruity of things. I knew of my own personal knowledge that those who had most to say on the subject, and those who adva advanced the most faultless theories on in the behalf of the coming generation, including that portion of, the, of it still unborn, were either those whose offspring could show the most complete record of infantile depravity, or belonged to that ever-increasing host of women who are living confusion of God's command, childless wives. I listened with 
decided interest to the epithets and the de of denunciation that were hurled at mothers by those who were too much occupied in the parental attention, which the neighbor's children received or did not receive to be cognizant of the fact that their own offspring were sadly neglected. The charity which he of Nazareth taught began at home. That which the devil teaches begins across the street. The devil's observation has been that those who are most enthusiastic in reforming the world have a household that is sadly in need of their tender ministrations. He might say to them that if they would keep their own backyards clean, it would be an easier matter for the neighbors to do likewise. But then there would be no avenue to afford an outlet for their nervous energy, and no problems for women's clubs to solve, which the devil decided from this point of view would be a deplorable calamity. After the question was deposed of the discomfort of many, and the satisfaction as many more, there followed the only sensible topic, the devil's estimation of the afternoon current event. Pity the devil, little girl. There was a response from a large, gaunt woman in a Gibson waist that took the form uh, the response, I mean, not the woman or the waist, of the conjecture as to the possible outcome of Queen Alexandra's latest social edict. She further avowed that all England was disappointed over the fate of Shamrock III, but that she was reliably informed that Sir Thomas Lipton was already negotiating for the building of a worthier successor, Shamrock the Fourth. Then a woman whose bump of tragedy was abnormally developed gave a most blood curdling account of the recent Servian assassinations. She des des described in this dark tragedy the handwriting on the wall, which she interpreted as a warning to the whole world against the seductions of an ambitious and unscrupulous woman. Following this was a bulletin by a lady in grey containing the most authentic account of the Russian peasantry, after which was set forth by a woman in an extremely high collar, the newest foible of the new king of Spain. She was succeeded by a woman with a turn-up nose who gave the racist chapters of the Princess Royal of Saxony Gyronaps episode. That woman's nose was a sturdy. It was possessed, it possessed the peculiar tilt that sniffs a scandal from afar. I thought she ought to have beaten appointed chairman of the smelling committee. Huh. Referring to the Crown Princess Louise of Saxony, there is a woman after your own heart, Mary. She told her patrimony for the ignitious fattest love, love, <laughs> while I say she is a woman after your own heart, there is this material difference between you. She was honestly deceived, but you are not. She, in her transport, believed that she had grasped the rainbow. Happiness, you know, it is a toddy tinsel. She believed that she saw just ahead the purple walls of paradise. You know, it is the fatal mirage suspended above the burning sands of Sahara. She believed she had awakened the inward harmonies of life. You know, it is a fool's blindness. And yet, you have sworn to give up fame and money and power and virtue and honor and righteousness and truth and logic and philosophy and genius, all, all for the gleam that you know is of tinsel, for the phantom in the clouds, which you know but lures its victims to madness and to death. Surely you enjoy the distri distinction of being the only living mortal who would, 
wittingly make such an exchange. You must know that I do not speak thus freely to everyone. I can afford to be honest with you because your comp compact with me is a firm and unalterable as at the eternal pillars of hell. You could not change it if you if you would. It does even the devil's soul good to be honest once in a while. But to return to the club meeting, the round sh shouldered intellectual women whose duty it was to report the principal event in America, arose and stated that after reading the papers and periodicals, after exhausting the columns of information, she had found but one universal theme, one topic of discussion, one subject of public interest. Mary McLean. There was a smile, a titter, a subsidence, the devil became interested at once. I find, the oracle stated, that Mary McLean has filled more newspaper space than any woman of recent years, the Duchess of Marlborough not ex excepted. She has probably been more discussed than any woman of her years living today, and for the privilege of being discussed has received thousands of dollars. When I probed to find the reason for all this, I learned that she had written the story of herself and later the story of her friend Annabel Lee. The sole object of the first named was to remind the devil that she was living and longing for him to come to her. I read the book and I found nothing in it but a few pretty words and an undertone of moral perverseness. Why, Mrs. Brownfield, do you mean to say that you have read the disgraceful book and have the face to speak of it here? Came in a piping voice from an energetic reformer whose principal occupation, according to her own language, was getting acquainted with Jesus Christ. Certainly, replied Mrs. B., I fancy I have the same privileges you accord to yourself. To be sure, to be sure, replied the caustic reformer. I don't see that you are anything ahead, for I found it nothing but a rot and abomination. I think, ladies, suggested the thin, spare intellectual woman, who for years had cherished dreams of literary fame, and who, no doubt, envisioned the shortcut made by Mary MacLean. I really think that you have not fully grasped the meaning of the book. You know it is an allegory, and allegories must never be taken literally. You also know there is a poetic license not accorded to all who wield the pen. And in discussing a book, we must discuss it from all sides. Seating herself with the evident satisfaction of having disgorged an accumulation of ideas. With this, the discussion became general, while the devil's interest waxed warmer. The chairman of the philanthropic department had a word to say on the subject. She usually had a word to say on every subject. I think, ladies, that many of us in this discussion are at a disadvantage. Now, for my part, I don't know any an allegory from a pigsty, nor poetic license from saloon license, or any other kind of license, but I do know that Mary McLean's book is not suitable for reading for Sunday school scholars. She says a whole lot about wanting to marry the devil, and I think if she really feels inclined to marry him... She ought to wait like the rest of her sex and let the devil propose to her. He is sure to come. For I think every woman living at some time in her life has a chance. But since she wrote it, she ought to have prefaced it so that those of us who are not interested in on how a woman makes up to the devil 
would have been warned against reading it. The book does not say that she got the devil, so it may not be so bad after all. The devil still sat mute. The discussion was getting personal, but he made no manifestation. Well, from one of the enthusiastic members, I think all those who have expressed themselves have read the book in vain. I should pronounce it a perfect gem. The subscriptions are magnificently superb, and that cunning little dialogue with the devil is too cute for anything. She has made him appear so stunning that most of us would fall in love with him. The book does the book does not say that he is so awfully bad. And oh, when she tells how lonely and unhappy she is, one's heart almost breaks for her. She wanted so dreadfully much to make some money and get away from Butte, and which one of us has not felt that way at some time in her life. That now since she she has succeeded. I think she ought to be the most awfully praised. Receding herself with the air of a victor who had captured the crown. I fail to see, said the philosophical sister from home department, just how the last speaker can eradicate all evil from the book. It is beyond my question. Immoral, but immorality often teaches a moral. Mary McLean says that she believes the devil rules the world, and it certainly looks that way at times. Consequently, she petitions the devil for marital aid. The book contains a great many things that the best of us could profit by. There are many parents who think the sole duty they owe to their offspring is to beget them and feed them and clothe them. Mary McLean has shown that there are higher nobler duties of a parent to a child, and that the weight of obligation is on the side of the parent. She has told us that even children long for congenial surroundings, and that their little lives are shaped for good or for evil, almost exclusively by home influence. You housekeepers who toil from morn till night, that things may be neat and in order, and the family meals on time could, from reading her book, ask yourselves the question, what does it profit while the heart and mind of my child are hungry? She has told us what the home is without love. How empty is the marriage life tie when there is no love to sanctify it. She has told us on the hard, cruel selfishness of the world, of how humanity is faltering for a few kind words and a little more love. There are many lessons in that book that we could teach, we could each take home. Let us call the good and leave the evil. Where was the truth ever analloyed? She resumed her seat amidst the applause, that characteristic of women that is so easily turned to scorn. They encourage theories and lofty ideals, then pull down those who strive to live up to them. The devil applauded with the others, for he was beginning to feel a little ugly at the way Mary McLean was being maligned by those women. For my part, in a harsh, rasping voice, from the flannox of the refreshment seekers, the only thing that I could find in the book was that she wanted a man and wanted him bad. Having delivered herself to the burden of an opinion, she resumed her seat with a great deal of satisfaction, remembering that she was the happy possessor of a biped that enjoyed the overwhelming honor of wearing pants. Calls of Mrs. Gatewood, Mrs. Gatewood, let us hear from Mrs. Gatewood, came from all parts of the room. A tall, dignified, rather handsome woman of perhaps 40 or 45 years, arose and was recognized as Mrs. Gatewood by the chairman. She differed from the previous speakers in that she was calm and deliberate. 
Madam President, and ladies of the club, she said. I have read the story of Mary McLean, and I must confess that I read it with an absorbing interest. To me, it is a marvelous book. She is a genius, without doubt. A genius, as I understand the term, is one who peers down into the innermost heart of things and who has the courage to speak truthfully of what he finds there. Mary McLean, like a diver, has descended to the bottom of the sea. She tells us it is strewn with grinning skeletons. We have been trying to believe the fable that it was covered with mystical coral caves and peopled with bewilderingly beautiful mermen and mermaids of the sea. We knew this was a delusion, but we tried all the harder to conceive ourselves of its truth, convince ourselves of the truth. While I say that Mary McLean is a genius, I grant you that she is an unwholesome genius. We would be better left alone with our idols, albeit we know they, where they stand on feet of clay. I said her book was to me, a marvelous work. It is marvelous. And the fact that a girl of 19 years could have sounded the depths that she has sounded marvelous in the fact that one so young could have torn aside the curtains as she has done and revealed truth in all its hideousness. Marvelous in the fact that a mere child could have ransacked the carnal houses of life, and dragged forth their sheeted deed to be jeered and hooted and spat upon by the mob. She was deterred neither by fear nor compassion, her book coming as it does from a 19-year-old girl presents itself to me with a force of a revelation. Most of us that age, saw life through the glow of a wondrous huge spectrum. She sees it in all the nakedness as a pile of stones and a barrel of lime. She says, and no words to me were ever sadder, take anything at any point and deceive yourself into thinking that you are happy with it. But look at it heavily. Dig down underneath the layers and layers of rose-colored mists, and you will find that your thing is a pile of stones and a barrel of lime. Imagine that coming from a 19-year-old girl. It's astonishing. It's incredible. It is, a, it is past all conjecture. I have asked myself many times, how is it possible for one so young to have delved so deep? She does not disgust or offend me, she awes me and amazes me. Mrs. Gatewood resumed her seat. Many forgot to applaud, so transfixed were they by astonishment. Others stared in other blankness, not being able to comprehend a word of what was said. A few in their hearts would have liked to endorse Mrs. Gatewood's remarks, but they dared not. They hardly had the courage to confess to themselves, much less to the others, the hideous things that were concealed behind the curtain. They shook their heads and smiled and affected to hug their delusion still more closely to their breasts. Oh, Mary, you gave those women a good shaking up. <laughs> there was some lively skirmishing amongst the most of them to get their dead under cover. I began to think I had never duly appreciated you and was just on the point of rising to make remarks myself when the chairman preemptively remarked that the hour of business session had arrived. We have business of importance, she announced, and with the announcement I gathered up my bones, my wallet, my metal heart, my hypocrisy, and I left. When I got away, I laughed till my sides ached. What fools these mortals be, <laughs> to be sure. You're very ingenious, 
and captivating devil. 28. My extremely turbulent Mary. It is a hell of a time you want, little girl. A hell of a time, you say. You are weary of living. You are weary of dying. You are weary of thieving. You are weary of lying and long to be lost in a furious world. It's a hell of a time you want. 'You are tired of eating, you are tired of sleeping, your liver itself has grown tired, your poor wooden heart has worn itself out, and your two good legs can scarce tote about you. You are tired, so tired of moping and weeping, it's a hell of a time you want. Your most worshipfully wicked devil. 29. My wild, blatant Mary. I am immensely pleased with myself tonight. Mm -hmm. I have just accomplished an almost impossible feat. If you could see me now, Mary, you would fall in love with me all over again, I am sure, for I am truly radiant with my victory. Indeed, I am magnificent. And what is this almost impossible feat which I have accomplished? You did not know there was anything impossible to the devil? <laughs> ah, Mary, I wish you were right. I have many parts to play, and the game that promises least to me is a combat with the arch enemy of mine, a mother's love. I have been vanquished so many times by the same foe that I am ready almost to confess myself beaten at the very outset. Yet, once in a while, I am victorious. I was today. I entered a cottage where a babe, fresh with the dews of heaven, lay smiling in its mother's arms the little mite of humanity that had forced its way into the mother's life was the only tie that held her to the memory of her murdered love. And again, the only bond that restrained her from a life of sin. Six months ago, the tiny eyes that today laughed into hers were opened under a cloud of dishonor. The little life conceived in sin and brought forth in sorrow, was fast becoming a landmark of shame. Why? She wailed, why should I be cursed forever with the evidence of my sin, while he, my partner in crime, goes utterly unscathed? I am a thing for the finer of finger of scorn to point at, while he, who should wear the brand of Cain on his brow, as he does on his soul, walks unspotted among them. While every door is closed to me, he stands unchallenged by the world. Why should this little life be thrust upon me, me only, to be a millstone about my neck, while he who is equally guilty with me goes forth untouched by the breath of his disgrace? Ah, thus it is with that with a man and the creature who bears the plague-tainted name of woman. I only laughed and reminded her of the time when she listened to my voice without remonstrance and yielded to my temptation without fear of consequences. I taunted her with the memory of those days when sin was sweet and the devil was a generous paymaster when she accepted my character of love and yielded herself to its delirium. Poor fool that she was. I haunted her with the memory of all that she had lost, honor, hope, virtue, reputation, home, friends, love, and more than all her own inner consciousness of purity. The ecstasy of her sin, the bliss of love that made her sin so sweetly. I have changed to the gall of bitterness. The path of sin 
where all allurements of love were spread out before her in one grand panorama of beauty, I have transformed into the cold, stony path of the transgressor. The rose petals that strewed her path have withered and died, or been blown away on the wings of the wind, and the only, only thorns remain. The dews of spring have been congealed into winter's frozen shroud. I upbraided her for the folly. I mocked her with the scepter, the specter of that dream which made her sin so ravishing. I derided her loveless life by dangling before her eyes that scene of youthful folly, where love was made a living sacrifice on his own crimson-dyed altar. I tortured her with pangs of hell until the des desperation she fled from the scene of my persecution. She was asked to return home, back to the fireside of old Indiana farmhouse, but the conditions stipulated were that she could return alone. Should she desert the child of her love, the little waif, that had come into her life because of all of that love, the only thing that, that lessened the gloom of that departed love, the little soul that she had called into existence? Should she place this wee, helpless creature born in the image of its mother upon the world's doorstep again and again? I taunted her. I reproached her with evidence of her sin, I cursed her for her folly. I mocked her, crushed her broken spirit, until, frenzied, she laid the child at the feet of the cold, cold world and fled. I had won! <laughs> Wonderful devil that I am! to counterfeit the very sacredness of heaven and wring from a trusting woman the sacrifice of her womanhood and then victory of victories to make her abandon the innocent babe born of this accursed sacrifice. Ah, uh, this is my recompense, and I shall accept it without stint. Poor, foolish woman to be led by the devil and then kicked by the devil into hell. Will the fireside that you brought with the price of you you bought with the price of your child warm the depths of your desolate heart? Will the miles and miles that stretch away to the east and offer you a resting place in a home of your youth separate you from the memory of your child? Will the sacredness of family ties by which you are surrounded enable you to forget the bond of motherhood? Can you ever Shut out your sight, the helplessness of those two little outstretched arms that pleaded their cause in their own mute way? Will this tragedy, which has enacted in the western mining town, ever haunt you less? The devil will not be idle, but with the help of you, Mary McLean, and your peripatetic philosophy will transform it for the edification of others into a comedy. There is no sin, there is no shame, for all was done through the blind, blundering sentiment of love. The devil rejoices in the fact that love is blind. He can thus lead the little god into any snare he may choose to prepare for him, Come, Mary, you can be of inestimable service to the devil. Go before him, imbue the minds of the young and unsuspecting with the spirit of your philosophy. Proclaim from the housetops the superfluousness of marriage. Convert the world to your so-called theory of love, and the devil will do the rest. But what, little girl, will you do with a child? Yours, enthusiastically, the devil. Chapter 30 My dear, sweet little cynic, 
Remember, Mary, that every bronze and copper beam has its moat, and every diamond its flaw, every pearl its fleck, and every sunset its hand breadth of gray that shall grow and grow and grow until the purple and gold are swallowed up in darkness. Your self-sufficient devil. 31. My own trusting Mary. I am distressed. I am outwitted. I am routed. I have an adversary who rises in his strength and grandeur, and I seem to be unable to cope with him. He is young, he is human, he is natural, yet the wiles of the devil are not sufficient to draw him from his position. He defies me. In the face of the world, despite the magnitude of my forces, he dares to raise his voice against me. He has utterly lost me, I fear, but could I only cause him to stumble? His host of followers might turn in confusion. I am not often thwarted, but resistance is only weapon that causes me to turn and flee. That is the only argument that I cannot meet. Had I but a, a delusion, a, a, a hallucina hallucination with which to weaken his power of resistance, I might, perhaps, defeat him. Could I only fabricate some false doctrine, build up some false shrine, raise up some false god? I might hope to conquer him. Could I only blind him with some new theory, weave about him some spell that might stupefy his energy, breathe upon his senses the sweet intoxication of my allurements? In his helpless state, I might overpower him. I shall now try woman, that strange combination of mystery and light, strength and frailty, hope and uncertainty, who becomes at once the meditative influence between man and his creator, and again the very incarnation of myself. When the fair form of woman, to solace a man's heart, was fashioned and informed by old Mosilibe's art, the crowned heads of heaven were summoned to lavish every charm and attraction ere woman he'd finish. Some gave to, to her beauty, some godlike affection. Their united endowments just made her perfection. Above all, the rich gifts the each goddess bestowed, the richest, tis said, to the gods she owed a casket it is this and contains the rich treasure of woman's rare love and an infinite measure when the, the seal has been broken and the treasure revealed. No man who has seen it could wish it were sealed. Yes, I shall try woman. It is woman who from the foundation of the world has ever wrought man's utter undoing. When I first planned the fall, I did it through the subtlety of women. Kings have crossed swords to win her, her favor. Nations have plunged into war at her command. Kingdoms have been sold for her smiles. And empires have followed in the wake of her fascination. States have been wrecked by her witchery. And history has been shaped according to her fancy. The destiny of the world is folded in the hollow of her hand. She is always a trump card, and when played by the devil, <laughs> the devil always wins the trick. Woman is my trump of trumps, and woman shall I play. He is human. He is in the glory of young manhood. He knows the meaning of my seductions and the blind, compelling force of my captivity. In time past, he wavered at the whisper of my promises and sipped at the fountain of my pleasures. He halted before the throne of my deity, but as one who suddenly awakens from a dream, he gathered the strength of his convictions and forced his way beyond the secret scope of my temptations. To the spell of my subsequent allurements, 
he has proved impervious. In the majesty of his strength, he defies me and my army. Verily, I am persuaded that he does not stand of his own strength, but is upheld by that supreme power, which I have never been able to overcome. Flesh alone is weak and prone to do evil, and it is only when I find it supported by strength of my fist, of my first adversary, that I am unable to effect its downfall. I can never destroy. I can never paralyze that power. Could I only clothe it in my own light, I might use it to my own purpose. To this end, woman, I shall employ. To those who are my most faithful followers, and least likely to betray me, I have insinuated that the master himself is but the product of man's folly and woman's perfidy. When man is lost to reason and woman is lost to virtue, the devil laughs at the consequences. What role shall she assume? Shall she pass meek-eyed before him and steal her away into his heart through the innocence of the vestal virgin? Shall she smile at him from beneath the confirmation veil? Shall she melt his heart to pity through the guise of the, of the Magdalene? Shall she daily, shall, shall she dally him with mischievous game of, of, of the coquette? Or shall she dazzle him with the revelation of woman as she is? Which would be most surely and most swiftly win? Up, little Mary MacLean, I have need of thee. Do thou prepare to the devil's bidding, yours in haste the devil. 32. My visionary, Mary, and what do you think love is, little girl? A bird of paradise, which you sought to lure into your, your net by the careless abandon of your portrayal, or which you hoped serpent-like to charm until you might creep near enough to throw salt upon its tail. In your flights of wayward fancy, your eyes beheld him Poised high above you, you gazed till he seemed but, but a speck, ca careering, is that what that is, careering? The, the ether of heaven. You were dazzled by the splendor of his plumage and in an in inheritance which has always been an envy of his kind. From behind your high board fence, you watched this beautiful thing with an intensity that filled you with desire to hold it in your hand to possess it. You measured the distance between your own circumscribed sphere and the dizzy height at which your bird of paradise was poised, just as you were beginning to realize that this dazzling creature was forever beyond your reach. <laughs> Lo, he descended. He came nearer, 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 until you could even discover Distinguish the emerald from the gold on his breast and the vermilion from the sapphire on his wings. You trill to him an imitation of a song that his mate, but he de deigned not an answering note. What, oh, what can I do to bring him nearer, you exclaimed. I might climb to the top of my high board fence and beckon to him, but would he ever descend within the reach of my arms? I might scatter crumbs on the sand uh, of, the, of the barrenness to tempt him from his lofty height, but would he ever circle low enough to discover them? I might build him a nest on top of the telegraph pole in front of this house, but would he ever seek its warmth and tenderness? I must have him, but how can I secure him? You thought and pondered, and finally wondered if even a bird of paradise could be deceived by ornament. You arrayed yourself in gugas and tinsel and si to simulate the object of which you coveted. So adorned you, mounted the housetop, and spread your glittering trappings to the sun. You whistled such a note as thought might emanate from his own emerald throat. He halted in his flight, and poised in the blue ether of heaven. He vouchsafed to you one look, then tuck to his wings. Yours compassionately, the devil. Chapter 
Chapter 33. My most astonishing, unaccountable Mary, I feel in view of the intimacy which has sprung up between us in the course of these letters that you are interested in all that I do. However, that may be, I do know that I experience a peculiar delight in confiding to you my movements. Today I went calling, and even there I learned something of importance con concerning yourself. Now, don't smile and fancy that I am becoming frivolous because I chose to call in the neighborhood for an order to keep up with the smart set. I must do as they do, and it keeps me a humping. I stopped first at Miss Ambergris. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Deville? I haven't seen you since Mrs. Youngblood's dance, taking the tip of my two fingers as gingerly as though they had been two chestnuts, two hot chestnuts. Quite well, thank you, I replied, with a patronizing air that the devil knows how to assume advantageously. I have thought of you so often and wondered if you had heard that young bloods had parted. <gasps> parted? gasped Mrs. Ambergris. And all the society people, their guests not two weeks ago. It seems incredible. How did you hear of it? Mrs. Hornblower is my authority, and she told me that Mrs. Gabs told her. Yes, I have the whole thing now, gloated Mrs. A. Mrs. Brown told Mrs. Gabs, Mrs. Doolittle told Mrs. Brown, and Mrs. Newcomb told Mrs. Doolittle. I know because Mrs. Newcomb's and Mrs. Youngblood's hired girls are sisters. They always go home together every night, and that is how the Newcombs and the Youngbloods happen to know so much about each other's affairs. For my part, I never did like Mrs. Youngblood anyway. People have wondered for a long time how she could dress and entertain as she does. I always thought there was something strange about it myself. Ambergris salary is $27.95 a month, more than Youngblood's, and I I can't afford to do their thing, the things that she does. Would she... We could all give dances and dress fine if, with a meaning wink of her black, snappy eyes... That's right, that's right, I repeated deploringly, at the same time nodding my head in compliance with all that she said. That little minx, exclaimed Mrs. Ambergris, who was making the most of her opportunity to satisfy her innate love for scandal and her particular enjoyment of the downfall of a woman. And to think that she has been received into society here, and the ladies have been so nice to her. Well, I'll freeze her the next time I see her. I'll tell, I'll at least let her know that Caroline Ambergris has found out what she is. Oh, don't mention that what I said to you, I returned apologetically, knowing that was the surest way to advertise it. I didn't mean to say anything that would reflect on Mrs. Youngblood. I have always been very fond of her, and in an insinuating tone that Mrs. A understood, and was secretly pleased to note. Oh, you must be going, she said, following me to the door. I'm so glad you came, and thankful to have learned the straight of the Youngblood affair. Now, do come again, won't you? Why, I do believe that Mrs. Youngblood driving up to my gate now. Yes, that is she, I replied, in a conciliatory tone, at the same time drawing Mrs. A's attention to Mrs. Y's handsome carriage wrap. Speak of the devil, etc., etc., etc. Why, how do you do, Mrs. Ambergris and uh, Mrs. Deville? came in a sweet, gentle tone from the lady in question as her carriage drew up in front of the gate. In the meantime, I had been observing Mrs. A, who inwardly felt that she would like to cut her, cut her,
but who realized that the gorgeous new hat which Mrs. Youngblood was wearing deserved some recognition. Quite well, thank you. And how are you? Won't you get out, she called most patronizingly, as with furative scrutiny she observed that Mrs. Y was sporting a magnificent new ostrich boa. I saw with satisfaction that the young blood stock had advanced proportionately. Oh, no, thank you, she replied. I haven't time. I just stopped to say goodbye. Oh, you're going away? Just for a trip. Papa sent me an invitation to accompany him with uh, to and Alberta on a trip through Yellowstone Park, and the invitation was accompanied by a generous check. That is just like Papa. He is always sending me something. How charming! I ventured for Miss. I ventured for Mrs. A was way much overcome to recognize how. Oh, that was me. How charming! The demands of courtesy. Yes, it is. I'm sorry I did not get around to see you, but I have been so busy getting ready. I have taken this opportunity to see them, those whom I felt I could not leave without a word, at least. How fortunate that I came to can see you both here. How perfectly delighted I am to know that you are going to have such a splendid trip, chimed Mrs. A, while I saw ill-concealed envy darken her countenance. After a few more stereotyped expressions, goodbyes were said, the lady in the carriage was borne away, oblivious to the fact that opprobrium, opprobrium had been hurled at her. The lady of the house gathered up her spleen and went back to the stool of her discontent, while the devil pursued his hypocritical course. Presently, I met a pair of society buds who were discussing a member of their set. Oh, said one, I think Miss Swan is perfectly lovely. She wears the swellest gowns and always looks so stunning. Yes, her new hat has six tips on it, and they did not cost a cent less than three dollars apiece. But she has an awfully ugly mouth, don't you think? Oh, to be sure, no one would ever call her a beauty with that mouth and her sallow complexion. I passed on. I called at this house and at that, and my varied experiences were very similar to those already recorded. Presently, I was ushered into a little parlor whose, whose peace and comfort I had so often coveted. This was a door from which none were ever turned away. Its mistress was at times, have entertained, angels unawares, but I am sure that she often harbored the devil in disguise. Agents and peddlers, no rebuffs here, and when dismissed, were dismissed in a gentle and forbearing manner. I always stopped at this door because I, in the most unsuspecting manner, its mistress gave me a great many pointers. I had succeeded in co coaxing from her the name of the latest recipient of her charity, as well as the names of those whose condition she anticipated bettering, when the unmistakable rap of female peddler was heard. Can you spare a little of your time? she asked in a most persuasive tone, as a hostess opened the door and extended to her a mute invitation to enter. I have here an assortment of toiletry, toilet articles, she said, and immediately began to display the mysterious contents of the little satchel, much like a half-sized dress suitcase, which she carried. I carry everything for beautifying of the face and form, orris root paste for the teeth, magnolia cream for the complexion, pomegranate lotion for the lips, extract of rosemary for the hair, heart of seashell powder for the ears, belladonna pupil dilator for the eyes, black diamond pencil for the eyebrows, carbon wax for the eyelashes, white hawthorn salve for the hands, ruby dust for the fingernails, topaz emerald for the toenails, producing innumerable chars, boxes, tubes, and bottles from the depths of the little satchel, which I eyed now as a truly miraculous object. Our hostess took each article as it was handed to her, and after a dutiful inspection, passed it over to me. The goods are all warranted, continued the agent. They have been duly tried and endorsed by the woman whose name they bear, Mary McLean. 
With this, I almost started from my chair, and my first thought was, what will she do next? Yes, continued the lady, we carry everything for beautifying the person and for preserving the beauty one naturally possesses. There is no longer any need, or might I more properly say, any excuse for a homely woman. I became intensely interested, for, try as I may, I cannot conceive even the least liking for a plain woman. Now this magnolia cream is what Mary McLean uses for her complexion, and she has a face of a Madonna-like sweetness. She says so herself. There was a most wonderful transformation in her since she began to use this cream. You remember also that she said had naturally beautiful hair. Still, she uses extract of rosemary three times a week, rubbing it well into the scalp. And now her her trails, her hair trails on the floor and envelops her like a circular. This, running on like Tennyson's brook, is the Mary McLean message cream. And I'm not so sure, interrupted my hostess, that the name Mary McLean would lend much character to your goods. Oh, yes, madam. Maybe you do not know the lady. I only know her through her book, and I've no desire to cultivate her further, unless I might point out to her the evil of her ways, replied my hostess with a righteous toss of her head. Of course, my goods have nothing to do with her book, madam. Then she has quit writing books and gone to manufacturing face cream and the like. Well, she has developed more sense than I thought her capable of. She was probably relieved. She, she has probably realized that nature needed a few artificial appliances before she could capture the man devil. I ventured with the demureness of self righteousness, self righteous saint. Well, you know, we must assist nature, continued the lady. Now, here is a jar of monumental cream, a delightfully smooth and bland compound. It was warranted to, to produce, in an incredibly short space of time, the most beautifully rounded throat and chest, and this, a bottle of liquid alabaster, goes with it for removing all scars and blemishes. This, displaying a curious little article, the like of which I had never before seen, is the best plumper an electrical device for enlarging the bust and is accompanied by a pamphlet giving valuable directions. It is especially recommended by Mary McLean, for she is no longer driven to the extremity of arranging nine cambric handkerchiefs in the bosom of her dress in order to obtain that graceful outward curve, which is sought after all by all true femininity. You, madam to my hostess, would find this invaluable as you seem to rather, as you seem to be rather thin-chested. We're almost to the end, which a long chapter. I have never the time nor money to devote to such things. I am always busy looking after the Lord's work. I only fancied that the Lord might love her little brother and might point to her more pride if she could only make herself a little more attractive, my hostess is a dear, kind-hearted little woman, and I felt thankful to, that the Lord loved her, for the devil could not. Does that please you, little girl? What else have you, I inquired, more interested in the transformation of Mary McLean than in the stock of goods. I have here a liquid paste called Psyche's Bridal Veil that imparts to the, the various parchment complexion parchment complexion of bloom of youth, angelical abdominal ointment for reduction, redu reducing the size of the abdomen, corn salve, medicated sea foam soap, ramrod, corsets, everything. This exhibiting a nondescript affair, which resembled a collapsed water bag, is a new thing and fills a long felt want. It is an inflated rubber bustle. Mary McLean says she would like a flapjack without hers. One could, by the persistent use of monumental cream, develop a natural bustle 
that would not be advisable, as bustles are likely to go out of style at any moment. To be sure, it could be removed by Angelica abdominal ointment, but it would require much time and patience. Our voluble agent then exhibited a ghostly-looking thing with the eyes, nose, and most frightful grinning mouth, which she called a Juliet facial mask. And I informed us, and inf I'm sorry, and informed us it was to be worn during sleep. She said it would perform miracles. I asked her if it would remove the tan from leather. She said it would. It was truly a wonderful thing, but I wouldn't like my wife, if I had one, to wear such a thing during sleep. I'm sure it would give me a nervous turn. A hint to the wise, etc., etc. She next exhibited what looked like a baby's rattle, only it did not rattle, but which she said was an anti-crowfoot roller and would also perform miracles. It would take the crinkles out of waffle irons, for I asked her. I have also a book entitled The Physical Woman Rattled Our Irresponsible Agent and Explaining how to acquire a graceful carriage, a straight back and hips, any size one should desire. This has also been the in, inestimable valuable to Mary McLean, who has now discarded her modern petticoat altogether. We have, however, the Juno-esque hip pads for those who are not preserving enough, persevering enough to follow the instructions, and here producing a particularly ugly thing, which I was sure was a rat for the hair, is something no woman of your build, especially during this era of short skirts, should be without the perfection of false calf. It is to be adjusted thus, suiting the action to the words, the devil held, held his breath, but I am compelled to admit did not glance up to the ceiling just at the particular moment and it is warranted not to slip or get out of position. Mary McLean says she would not be without a pair for the world. Oh, my! And I gave a gasp that brought forth solicitations from my hostess in regard to the, the state of my health. Hitherto, little girl, I had fancied that you were free from all these frauds that at times delude even me. But this demon... This demonstrates the fact that you are the devil's own child. Have you so soon fallen into the, the follies of your sex? Have those who two good legs that once you were proud to own been stuffed to appease this last phase of your vanity? Of course they are your legs, and you can do with them as you please. You may dazzle mankind and become the envy of womankind because of their generous measurements. But for the love of hell and the devil, remove your perfections before I arrive. This, Jehoshaphat, more to follow, holding up a bottle of perfectly colorless liquid, is the most wonderful discovery of the age and is something I sell to almost everywhere I stop. It is Aladdin's magic hair curler and will instantly, upon application, produce in in the straightest of hair, the most beautiful and apparently natural waves. No more curling irons, kid curlers, curl papers, etc. to dis disgust your husband. Disgust your husbands. Holly G. This, producing a bottle too similar in appearance to one she had exhibited that the possibility of their being mistaken one for the other had me shudder after I learned the second bottle contained hair vamooser, a compound warranted not only to remove all superfluous hair, but to absolutely destroy the follicles so that they could not possibly sprout again. Picture the catastrophe, Mary, if you, in your haste, should mistake hair vamooser for Aladdin's magic hair curler, and you with such beautiful hair, too. It almost gives me a heart failure to contemplate such a thought. Promise me, Mary, that you will keep one bottle upstairs and the other downstairs. It would be safer. Then I have a little Cupid garters, clattered the unabashed agent. Holy Moses, I wonder that all women are not lunatics. 
These garters are particularly recommended by Mary McLean. They are red, red quality and mag magnetically charged. I have also the Hesperids perfume and I don't believe I care for any in your, in your line today, said my hostess. They're all very good, of course, but I do not care for them. After futile protestations of their mir miraculous merits, she was finally persuaded to replace her store, but not without many reminders that this was the first time that Mary McLean goods had been offered for sale. True, she remembered that there was Mary McLean brand of Tabasco sauce, as well as a similar brand of cigars, but nothing along the line of her goods. At last, she was inclined to click her little satchel with all its wonder-working devices on the inside, and with the seraphic smile which all her profession cultivate, she graciously inquired the name of the lady next door and was gone. I sat speechless. I could see nothing but bewildering visions of inflated bustles, hip pads, fault calves, bust plumbers, grinning facial masks, etc., and horror of horrors, all the paraphernalia attached to the person of Mary McLean. I know now how to sympathize with the astonished bridegroom, who, upon being conducted to the bridal chamber, was puzzled as to whether he was expected to sit up with the part of his bride, which occupied the chair, or to retire with the bed part, which had gone to, with the part which had gone to bed. Yours in perplexity, the devil. We have one more chapter, that many pages. Should we stop now or should we join next week? You could type there really quickly if you're awake. Now we have two more chapters. They're short, they're brief. Chapter 20, 34. On the Lake Hell, 1903, my own un unspeakable Mary, you have besought me to come to you. Listen here, little girl. While I tell you a story, once I went in all the way, my majesty, in my strength and in my power, in all my adorable wickedness to a woman young and all alone, she was beautiful as the dawn, passion, passionless as snow, ethereal as an angel. Her hair, her fair soul, crowned with a halo of virgin purity, looked out through the eyes of an infinite trust. I lifted her in my arms and bore her away, far from her weary, wretched nothingness. Whether are we going, kind devil, she asked. To the veil of yellow light, I answered, where grows the mystic tree of knowledge, watered by the spirit of love. And is this veil far, kind devil? Far, very far. Over the green wetness of sweetness, I said, what grows in this veil, kind devil, besides the mystic tree of knowledge watered by the spring of love? Ah, mint and white hawthorn, and myrtle and rose and hyacinth and the jasmine and, and bluebells, I answered. When will we reach this veil, kind devil? When the sun touches the meridian and the light is golden yellow. And even as I spake, there was wafted to us over the heaven, kissing hills, a breath of myrtle and rose, and a wonderful light of transfiguration descended upon us. Under this light, that never was on land or sea, her, her young woman's body shone resplendently, a thing of beauty and light and love, Aphrodite, when she rose from the sea, was not more than dazzling more dazzling than she, clothed as she was in the mist of the morning with the beads of dew in her hair and her bare feet of ivory whiteness resting in bed of wet blue bells. I led her to a bank of purple hyacinth and lo, the mystic tree of knowledge watered by the spring of love bent above it. Were we together, she and I, or were... We were together, she and I, in the gold light for days, for days. But there, there was no marking of time there. In the veil of yellow light, one day is as a thousand years, and one thousand years is as one day. 
Do you love me, sweet devil? she asked. I, from the depths of my metal heart, I answered. <laughs> she turned her fawn-like eyes to me. Their look of boundless faith changed into one of uncertain bewilderment. Then, summoning the most potent magic of my art, I cast upon her such a spell of rapturous abandonment that she exclaimed, O oh, glorious devil, clasp me, crush me, consume me with hot love, blister me with your burning lava kisses, wrap me round so tight with your strong steel arms that my quivering woman's body shall all but break in your embrace. Send such a cutting ecstasy through my super-sensitive nerves as shall threaten to snap them in twain. For this I have given up fame and money and power and virtue and honor and righteousness and truth and logic and philosophy and genius. Make it worth the price, O devil. And the children you will bear me, will they be human, angel, god, or devil? Devil. Devil, born in the image of yourself, O oh marvelous devil, can you bear it, the inf infinity of love? I asked. Yes, yes, I abate nothing to it, it, abate it nothing, though I die. Then I touched the young woman's body with fire, the devil's fire, and she fell in a swoon like death. Not death, though, but seeming death from an ecstasy more poignant than pain. Here, I drew a canopy of clouds about us, for the things I said to her and the things she said to me on that bank of purple hyacinth under the mystic tree of knowledge, watered by the spring of love, must never be revealed. Dost thou like the picture, Mary? Yours is statically and sulfurously, the devil. Chapter 15. My own benighted Mary, rest, rest. Ah, oh, there is no rest for the devil. God made the world and the glory thereof in six days and rested on the seventh. All things whatsoever rest except the prince of darkness. The days come and go, and nature lies down to sleep. Trees of the forest chant a lullaby to the flowers that nod in the field, and to the tender blades of grass that nestle at their feet. The waves of the ocean draw the shades of night about them, and rock to sleep the myriad forms of life that throng, thronging, that throng his, its mighty waters. The beasts of the field that are not tortured by man's brutality lie down to nature and rest and refreshment. Almost with the setting of the sun, the weariness of childhood is lost in balmy sleep. The pure in heart lift up their souls in thankfulness at eventide and invoke God's watchful care for another night, then lay them down to peaceful slumbers. The wayward, whose transgressions have been many, can thus escape the spectre of rebuke, and the sin bespotted creature who plods this way, a menace to the world, a repro reproach to the devil, has always this recourse from remorse. The world sleeps, but the devil must press on. I was driven out from the glory of light and condemned to live always beyond its halo. Darkness became my legacy. I have not despised my fallen estate, and the darkness which I am doomed to inherit has blessed my labors and added strength to my kingdom. When the curtain of night envelops you, little girl, and a myriad of voices, mosquitoes, chant the lullaby of sleep in your ears, there is no rest for me. There is no deep solitude to tempt me from my labors, no rosette couch to woo me into slumber and to refresh my metal heart with the inspiration of a dream. No kind, unconscious sleep in which for a time I might forget even myself. No gentle hand to draw the veil of oblivion around me for a season. No, from day to day, year to year, eternity to eternity, I am ever present with myself I am forever confronted with blackness. The horror of my surroundings is constantly before me. The victims of my fiendish subtlety are never beyond my sight. The ravings of the damned 
swelling in one mighty requiem, beat constantly upon my ears. The writings of their agony rise always before me. The holocaust of hell spreads its lurid glare unceasingly around me. There is no escape. Hell is my throne, and I am doomed to live forever under the weight of its crown. Eternity is spread out before me, an eternity of hell. Can you picture, Mary McLean, what this is like? No. The infinite, the finite mind cannot grasp the meaning of eternity, to say nothing of an eternity of hell. It is hell, where all the evil tendencies of earth are culminated, where every restraining influence is withdrawn. where sin in all its hideousness goes on repeating itself forever and ever. Can you imagine the state where kindness, charity, sympathy have never in entered, where God's infinite spirit of love, an unconscious chain binding together the, the creatures of earth's hovers not, where the human soul, so poisoned, so bespotted, so distorted, so damned, lives on forever in the depths of its own damnation, where cruelty is more, more cruel and the rod of the oppressor is more oppressive, where suffering is never relieved, that where an eternity of punishment is met, meted out for those who have transgressed the laws of rights. I was the first who transgressed, and this is my inheritance. I delight forever in the torments of hell. I am glorified by the, the abject abasement of those whom I have led to their own destruction. I am exalted by the sight of their agony. I am rejoiced by the sound of their wailing. I am ravished by the echo of their remorse. And until the exaltation, I turn and, and wreak upon them the flood of my hatred and my vengeance. I love to see them struggle, struggle, then fall, fall lower. I triumph in the means which heaven has given me to make hell a place eternal damnation. When I am surefitted and devilish glee, I crucify again these wretched souls to ver vivify my fiendish enjoyment. I stretch their quivering forms upon the rack of torture, and bind them more firmly in the cankering chains of my bondage. I quicken to these sensibilities afresh with the fire of my devilish purpose, and leave them to vent the fury of their torture upon each other. This is hell. In hell. Between earth and hell, I have hung a, a, a curtain of heavenly enchantment. I have made the pathway appear like one unbroken dream of delight. The pitfalls I have spread over a carpet of flowers, the tumultuous roar of this pandemonium I have muffled till the unsuspecting might mistake it for a ripple of some distant melody. Hell must remain hell, and no sight or sound escape there, therefrom to thwart my purpose on earth, as the devil is a clever dissembler. You would like, little Mary McLean, to join the host of his followers on earth, but would you like to draw aside the curtain and enter the hell beyond? Would you like to the devil to love you for a season and then curse you for an eternity? Would you like to, to bask in the rainbow hues of his earthly kingdom, then sink into endless night? Would you crucify your soul for a fleeting pleasure that will haunt you forever and forever? Would you sell your soul to the devil for a day? For the, the which he will despise you through eternity? You have said that you would. <laughs> Yours sincerely and diabolically, the devil. 36. I think this is the last chapter. It's a little one. My little will-o'-the-wisp. Forgive me, Mary. My thought of my thoughtfulness. I may at times seem harsh, but you must know that I am never too harsh to open my heart to you in a flood of pleasure and delight. 
At times, in the heat of my impatience, I have almost clasped you in my arms. I have almost brushed the dews from your maiden cheek, and have almost sipped the wine from your ruby lips. In my fitful imagination, I have almost felt the glow of your young woman's body, and have almost wrapped you around with my strong steel arms. I have almost drunk the perfume of your languorous breath, and have almost caught the waves of sensuous delight that dash themselves against the windows of your soul. In times of meditation, I have chafed at the restraint with which circumstances and pressing duties have enthralled me, and in fancy, I have almost claimed you. In dreams, which were not all dreams, I have snatched you from the world, and have led you to the throne of my habitation, crowned you with the aureole of my glory, armed you with the scepter of my power, decked you with the jewels of the firmament, arrayed you in splendor of the morning, worshipped you with adoration of the spirit world, and loved you with the intensity of the devil. In fancy, I have basked in the sunlight of your presence. I have lavished upon you the wealth of Parnassus. I have laid at your feet the trophies of the ages and have studied your crown with the gems of the Milky Way. I have anointed you with the perfume of Hesperides, have poured upon your altars the incense of the gods and have caught the music of the spheres and translated it for your delight. I have poured out of you the rapture of my boundless soul, have compassed time and space with the limit of your wish, and have arrayed infinity in the rainbow tints of beauty for your declaration. In thought I have gone to you, and on the wings of the moonbeam, and have whispered to you of the poetry of love in tones so soft, so melodic, and so enchanting, that your soul was almost moved to answer, the refrain. I have caught the rays of the sunbeam as it flashed upon your vision, and its matchless radiance have hung upon your slumberous eyes until their infinite depths seemed almost melted into love. I have followed the hide-and-seek of the echo till I almost caught the whispered word, my soul would win from you. I have gone to you in the, in the rosy dawn and have painted upon your soul the pictures which almost wrapped you in the spell of my enchantment. I have lurked in the twilight shadows and have followed your presence through the purple afterglow of day till our ways seemed almost merged in one and you, through all eternity, were almost my own. Again, in eager hope and expectation, I have mounted the chariot of the wind as laden with the fragrance of the meadows. It kissed your ruddy cheek or toyed in wanton sport with your silken tresses and have almost felt your bosom with the ecstasy of my presence. In righteous thought tonight, my fancy almost claims you, my arms almost embrace you, and my lips almost press yours. I almost catch the light that burns within your eyes. I almost feel the thrill that passes through your form, and I almost, almost chain your soul in the bondage of a long, compelling kiss. My wild impatience is becoming more than I can bear, so speed the day when you may no longer be so near and yet so far, your loving and impatient devil. This is the final. 27, a uh, 37. The Infernal Mansion, Fall of Eve, 1903. My own intense Mary, Tonight, I stood in the ruby twilight. It was the hour of the grand transfiguration of the sun, when he gazes at the same time on the past eternity and shimmers in the headlight of the future. T'was the hour of the sunset's golden death. The full round moon was just peeing over the hills of the eastern horizon, as if were the loth to show her face in the presence of the majestic king of day. Gradually, and imperceptibly, the ruby had turned to purple, and the, and the gold to silver, white though the one tall spire like a 
like Butte, which stands to the south, still wore his tip of fire, like a flaming torch in the sky, like the great eye of the sun, I can look backward into the deep shadows of the past. And at the same time, penetrate with my prophetic sense far, far into the realm of the future. As I gazed into the years that have come, I saw a soul naked and shivering. It was creeping along the moonlight like a hunted thing. I quickened my pace and walked almost beside it. It was a soul, stripped of its robes of purity and branded with marks of shame. I presently, presently it halted in, in a lone, deserted space. Moonlight fell upon it, and I saw it lift its white hands in supplication, when, then wring them in agony of despair. I heard its cry of bitter anguish as it fell prone a little mound overspread with rough, sharp stones. It was the grave of a woman's honor, the grave in which she and her soul, one ghostly night, buried her young womanhood with no watchers but the moon, three pale stars and myself. Tonight, the same moon, the same three stars and myself looked down upon the soul in its travail. Oh, that a soul could die. Oh, that a soul could die, it wailed. Why dost thou keep lost soul? Weep, lost soul, I asked. It turned its eyes, burning with the light of immoral immortality, full upon me and cried, O oh, devil, devil, grant me one boon, one boon if thou canst. And what is the boon thou, ca th thou cravest, soul? Death, death. O oh, devil, oblivion, sweet oblivion, it cried, its white arms outstretched in agonized entreaty. Soul, dost thou not know thou canst not die? O oh, devil, summon all thy strength, all thy power, and smite me, smite me, me, O oh, devil, till I needs must die. Soul, did I sear thee with the branding irons of hell till thou wast shriveled up to nothing? Thou should still live. Oh, the wail of that lost soul, as it fell back upon the grave of the thing it had, it had murdered. The moon, as it affrighted, hid her face behind a cloud, and the three pale stars trembled. Then go away from me, O oh, mocking devil, it cried, and leave me alone, alone with my dead. Taunt me not with the memory of that day when this child of my bosom was slain, this child of innocence and truth. Why art thou here, alone, soul? Where is the woman, thy incarnation, that she is weeping not for her dead? In the halls of revelry tonight, she chided me because I would not go. Oh, I could not go tonight. Tonight, it is so like the ghostly night when we, we buried the young child of innocence, the same moon, the same pale stars, and thou, O oh devil. Oh well, isn't it better that she should forget, forget, forget that she murdered the child of innocence? For a time only, I said, O oh devil, if thou but see, she is coming, she has followed me, she will chide me for remembering, she will curse me for my one atom of faith. Fear not, soul, said I. Soul, soul, why art thou here? The woman asked of the tortured thing that lay prone upon the grave of her young womanhood. Because, because I cannot forget the child of innocence, it wailed. Go, go, forget, if thou canst, but curse me not. I curse thee not, soul. Came, come with me. I am unhappy with thee, but unhappier without thee, the woman said. And the soul rose and fell upon her neck and wept. I remember the day when the man-devil came to her from over the hills in all the pomp and vain glory of life. He came like the materialization of a dream. She fell under the fascination of his steel-gray eyes and became as one in a trance. He was bold and mystical and enchanting and strong. He came like a knight-errant of gold astride the gaily ca caprisioned charger, and she held out her hands to him in welcome. He was arrogant and dauntless and kingly and strong. He came like a prince from far principalities, his robe of Tyrian purple sweeping the ground. She received him with open arms and gave him of her inheritance. He was brave and majestic and valiant and strong. He came like Apollo, 
his brow wreathed in Par Parnassian laurel. Her spirit met his spirit, and it was like the meeting of the waters. He was grand and beautiful and romantic and strong. He came like a conquering hero, flushed with triumph and heralded by the loud alarms of victory. And she fell on the neck and kissed him and was resplendent and proud and stately and strong. He came like an army with banners, treading to the strains of marital music, and she cast herself a virgin sacrifice on his altar fires. He was confident and wicked and cruel and strong. He came like a red, red devil from hell, and she fell down on her knees and worshipped him. He was hard and cynical and devilish and strong. Show me the glittering paths of wickedness, she said. Lead me to the crystal palace whose walls and prison rainbows. Bring with me... Bring me within the sound of those rare voices, dowered with note of, to soothe the lost souls in hell. He said, I will. And he did. And in her delirium, her mad joy, she murdered this child of her soul, this child of innocence and truth. Then she and her stricken soul stole out to night, in the night, and buried her dead here in this lone forsaken grave, this lone forsaken grave with her no kindly feet save those of her soul ever made a pilgrimage, this lone forsaken grave which knows no visitation save that of her soul and of the cold unfeeling winds which sweep above its eternal silence. The man devil went on his way triumphant as the bee that kisses the rose remembering not the one among many whose fragrance was sipped. She waited for the returning and arrayed herself as a bride for her bridegroom. But he came not. She lamented and bewildered, refusing to be comforted, and went out and poured her tears into the rock's breast. Still he came not. She clothed herself in sackcloth and ashes and gazed from her window far out over the sand and barrenness, as though watching for the passing of an angel. Still he came not. She reviled herself that she was ever born, cursed the father who begat her and the mother who bore her, and blasphemed God. Still he came not. Years passed. Others came and whispered in her ear that the paths of the crystal palace were just as alluring as ever, the rainbows just as en en entrancing as the music, or the rare voices just as ravishing. She followed them. But the palace was turned to pitch, the rainbows to bands of mourning, and the melody of the rare voices to maddened discord. A look of horror, terrible to see, overspread her face, as if she had seen a ghost. I crept stealthily to her side and whispered, Let us go back to the lonely grave on the mountainside and bury your womanhood so deep that its ghost can never arise and haunt you again. She shuddered, but said, I will, tonight. Tonight, I asked. Ah, oh, no, not tonight. The moon is full, the three pale stars are out, and my soul is on watch. When, if not, when, if not tonight, I asked. When my soul sleeps, she whispered. Yours yesterday, today, and forever. The devil. Now, my darling... I actually wanted to I want to tell you the new book. But in order to tell you the new book, I want to just go back right over here to show you this page in this book. In the final chapter. So, mind you, I didn't know this and I'm going to tell you the book now. So, chapter 30 37 The Infernal Mansion. Now, I'm going to tell you the book that we are going to read next week. Unanimously, almost, The Devil's Mansion. So next week, tune in for The Devil's Mansion. That's what we'll be reading. Um, also, I would love to invite you to come out to Atlanta. If you are makers, if you create things, if you are artists, um, we are going to be doing the debauchery ball. We would love for you to come and sell your wares at our tables. We would love to have you there. Message me uh, 
Facebook is probably better. I'm quicker at responding there. Uh, message me there. I will be in Youngstown, Ohio, the end of October. So if you would like to have a reading, that's a, a great way to do it. Um, thank you for all of your likes, your comments, and your shares. Thank you for being my friend. And may you have a most pleasant night rest. Good night. Much love. <laughs>